Hello, I want to welcome you to another Power of the Word series. Today we're going to be looking at our third lesson in this series of 32. And that third lesson is, could this be Earth's final generation? Now I know much has been said as it relates to the last days, but so little has been said as it relates to understanding it from the Word of God. And today we want to see from the Word of God, could this truly be Earth's final generation? And brothers and sisters, what can we do to prepare to meet our Lord in peace. So join us as we study today's lesson, Could This Be Earth's Final Generation? Hello, I want to welcome you to our study today. As we prepare to go into the Word of God, let us have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for today. Give us understanding. Show us how to apply these things to our lives. In Jesus name. Amen. So we welcome you to our third lesson in our series. Um, Could this be Earth's final generation? Again, if you would like this Bible lesson, all you have to do is go to our website, um, egbibleschool.org, egbibleschool, one word, dot org, and you can download this free Bible lesson. Lesson three, could this be Earth's final generation. We want to get right into the Word of God. And once you have downloaded that lesson, if you notice in our previous studies, we're not going to deal with every particular question. In this format, we desire to cover the subject thoroughly. And so you have the outline there that you can go through and you can mark it and you can go through it with your Bible. We're going to go through the lesson. And even if we do not complete it all, We want you to be able to fill out all of your answers. And if you have any questions as in regards to anything you study, something you hear, please feel free to email us at egbibleschool at gmail.com. Again, that's egbibleschool at gmail.com. But again, so you have your lesson. We want you to go go through the lesson and answer it. And by the grace of God, as we go through all of the 32 lessons that we're going to go through, you would be able to explain the Word of God. You know, God tells us that if we study the Word of God, the Holy Spirit will bring these things back to our remembrance. It tells us that when we're brought and we're put in tight places, that we don't even have to meditate, the Bible says, on what we shall speak. But we ought to know in that hour that the Holy Spirit will give us words that our enemies can neither gainsay nor resist. The Bible says, study 2 Timothy 2.15 to show ourselves approved unto God. Peter says, and I like this, and I want to just read this, not in your lesson, but go to 1 Peter, and I pray that as you've been attending uh, these online studies, that you're becoming familiar with your Bibles. So Peter is after the book of Hebrews, right after the book of James. uh, 1 Peter, the first epistle of Peter, chapter 3, and I love what he says here in verse 15. He says, but sanctify the Lord. First Peter, chapter 3, verse 15. He says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready when? Always, he says, and be ready always to do what? Give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you, excuse me, with meekness, and with fear. So we don't have to be proud and puffed up, but we should be ready always. And as we study the Word of God, the Bible promises us in John 15, 26, that the Lord will bring these things back to our remembrance. That is a promise, brothers and sisters, that we should claim as we study the Word of God. You may think that you're in a situation where your mind cannot retain, but study the Word of God. As as the Bible says, find God's word and eat it up. Allow it to be the meditation of your heart. And brothers and sisters, in the time when you need it most, the Spirit of God will bring these promises back to us to be a comfort and a safeguard, not only for ourselves, but for others we come in contact with. We're studying today, could this be Earth's final generation? Now, if you remember, if you looked at our last lesson, lesson two, when we were studying, will there soon be a one world government? You saw how we went through Daniel chapter two. 
9. We are admonished in the book of Matthew that we ought to understand the book of Daniel because Daniel gave events that brings us down to the coming of Christ. We don't have to guess. We don't know the day or the hour, but the events outlined in scripture lets us know that the time is near. So we don't have to guess. <clears throat> we can anticipate the coming of the Lord. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah 25 that God's desire for us is that we would be able to look up and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. But we must draw nigh to God with our hearts as he desires to draw nigh to us. And so today, as we study our lesson, could this be earth's final generation? Lesson question one, it says, what is more important for us to discern than the weather? Notice what it says in the book of Matthew, chapter 16. And I want us to look in verse two, uh, Matthew, the 16th chapter. <clears throat> and we're going to look at verse two. What is more important for us that we would understand or need to understand more than the weather itself? Here, the Bible tells us in the book of Matthew, the 16th chapter. And I'll actually begin in verse one. So you can understand the context of why Christ answered in the manner he did. Matthew chapter 16, verse 1, the first book of the Old New Testament, it reads, The Pharisees also, with the Sadducees came, tempting, desired him that he should show them a sign from heaven. In other words, here these religious leaders of Christ's day, and they did not want to believe on Christ's word. So they came to Christ with a question, or, or tempting him as it were, just as the devil tempted him in the wilderness, here these religious leaders come, obviously under the inspiration of the enemy of righteousness. And so they come to Jesus with a, with a, with, with a temptation. In other words, if you're who you say you are, show us something from heaven. You know, do something great for us that we may look upon it and believe. And Jesus recognized that signs are not a true indication of our belief. We must not always look for signs as, a, as an, something to assure our faith, but faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we would have faith in, the, in Jesus and the promises of God, we must study the word of God. We must believe what God has said and not look to signs. We are told in the book of Revelation chapter 13 that the enemy, the Antichrist, is going to perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, the very elect. Thus, you and I must have the word of God as our, as our surety to stand against the wiles of the enemy. But the Bible tells us that they come to Jesus asking a sign, and notice what he says in verse 2, And he answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red and in the morning it will be foul weather for the sky is red and lowering in other words he says like individuals who can depict the weather you can look and see the sky forming and moving back and forth and you can say wow today is going to be a good day or you can look at the clouds and you can see how they're beginning to roll in those dark clouds. And you say, well, it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a wet day today. He says, you can look and you can discern all these things. However, he says, oh, you hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the what? Signs of the time. He says, you can know all these things, but you do not recognize the events that are happening all around you. In other words, Christ tells them evidence and prophecy has shown that I am who I am. Events have already testified to the fact that I am the son of God, that I am the scent of God, that I am the lamb that is to take away the sin of the world, but yet they refuse to believe. And he goes on to say, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And he says, no sign would be given them save that of Jonah. And even then that sign proved not enough to change their stubborn and hard hearts. So God says above all the things 
that we can know one of the greatest things and the benefits to you and I is to understand the signs of the times. Let's look at our next question. When asked for signs of the end, it says, what did Jesus, what was Jesus' first response? You're going to Matthew 24. The disciples come to Jesus. <clears throat> and as Jesus talked about the destruction of Jerusalem, they came because they associated this destruction with the end of time. They felt Jerusalem would last forever. It would never be destroyed. And they associated it with the end of time. And Jesus did not want to disappoint them. Jesus did not necessarily try to unfold to them all of the things that were soon to transpire to Jerusalem. He didn't want them to become disappointed <clears throat> because he knew that they were not in a spiritual condition where they could understand the implications of what they were asking. And so Jesus does not leave them in the dark. He unfolds the events. But as they would allow the Spirit of God to illuminate their minds and they would go back, they would see that Christ mentioned all these things. Notice what it says. Matthew 24, emphasis, we're emphasizing verse 3 and 4, but I want to start at verse 1. Matthew 24 again, the Bible says, And Jesus went out, departed from the temple, and the disciples came unto him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And notice this last phrase, and of the end of the world. They said, Lord, tell us when this is going to happen. You said Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Surely that is the end of the world. Let us, what are the signs that points to this event? What, 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 what should we look for to know when it is here, when we're at the end of time? Jesus doesn't immediately begin to talk about the destruction of Jerusalem. Notice what he starts with in verse four. Jesus said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. Jesus says one of the first things you must be aware of as you see these things coming is deception. Beware that you are not deceived. We are told in the Bible that if we search the scriptures, we will know what is true. Christ told us in John 7, 17, he said, if we will know, if we desire to do God's will, we will know the doctrines, whether it is of God or whether, whether it is of man's own devising. Jesus said in that verse, whether it's God or whether I speak of myself. In other words, if it's true or if it is error. And so he says, beware of deception. You and I in these last days must beware of deceptions of all grades that is flying in churches and out of churches, my friends. So God says the first sign that you and I should be aware of is the sign of deception. Look at this next question. Question three, as he began, the Bible says, as he began his forecast for the church, after mentioning a few early signs, Jesus prophesied the destruction of what city? Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Luke, because Luke 21 is where we're going, because Matthew, Mark, and Luke take up this same scene of Matthew 24. In other words, in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 are similar accounts of events that are to transpire. John's, um, John's gospel does not take up this line, but it is taken up by John in the revelation. Okay. So Matthew 24, uh, Mark 13, Luke 21, and the book of revelation takes up this same line of events that we're seeing here. God gave all of these gospel writers events of things that were to happen literally and locally there in Jerusalem and Judea, 
and worldwide that will impact us here in America and abroad in every country. Notice what he says in Luke 21. We are going to begin in verse 20. Luke 21, what city did Jesus prophesy destruction would come? Luke 21, beginning in verse 20, the Bible says, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed or encircled with armies, know, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Know that destruction in Jerusalem is nigh when you begin to see the city being surrounded by armies. This was fulfilled in the days of Titus. The Roman, arm, the Roman general, as he came and brought that Roman army, as they surrounded Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple in 70 AD. Now, I want us to notice that in your lesson, you're going to have various notes under the scriptures. And these are for your further understanding, your further insight into the things in which we're looking at, because historians have been able to now document things that the Word of God has said would come to pass before it actually happened. And so here we find that Jerusalem was destroyed just as Christ predicted that it would. Question four, what sign would let Christ's followers know that the desolation was nigh? What was the sign they were to see? when they saw the city being surrounded by armies. And here you have a note under question four, and it says in October, AD 66, Cestius besieged Jerusalem. The Christians in the city recognized this as the sign given by Christ. When the Romans suddenly withdrew, the Christians fled, not one losing his life. Soon, Roman armies led by Titus returned in AD 70. The city was destroyed. More than a million Jews perished. And so as those Christians believed the words of God, as these things were chronicled by the disciples and those who heard, those who gave heed to the word of God saw this taking place and they moved out of the cities, as God said that they were to do, but those who did not believe the word of God, those who had an intellectual religion, they stayed put. Those whose careers and their 401k and their retirements were more important to them than obeying the word of God. They went to church, but they were not true believers in God. Christianity was a convenient religion for them, but yet and still the world had more of their minds than the word of God. Paul says they love pleasure more than the words of God. And so when this, when they saw this happening, rather than responding, they were more concerned with the NBA of their day. They were more concerned with the NFL of their day. And this is what had their attention and they could not respond to the call of God. Brothers and sisters, I wonder, are we in the same position today? But let's move forward. Question five, what terrible experience would follow that event? Let's go back to Matthew chapter 24. Let's notice what Matthew says. What was to follow that event? Matthew, the 24th chapter. And I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse 29. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 29. Matthew 24, verse 29, the Bible says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. As a matter of fact, I'm actually reading the wrong verse. Pardon me. Question number five was verse 21. I was wondering, something didn't sound right. Notice what it says, Matthew 24, pardon me, verse 21, the Bible reads, For then shall be what? Great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor shall ever be. There was to be a great tribulation that would follow the persecution 
or the destruction of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD and there was to be a great tribulation that was to come upon the church. Now, when you look over the time period of the scattering of the Jews from the destruction of Jerusalem to the next signs that we're going to look at in a moment, Jerusalem or Rome, understand this, the church was persecuted under pagan Rome. That's with the emperors and the Caesars. Western Rome fell to the barbaric tribes in 476 AD. Western Rome, Rome was divided into two hemispheres, Western and Eastern Rome. Western Rome fell to the barbaric tribes. Today, we could liken them more to rebels as we see in various countries, in Yemen, Ukraine, in Russia, uh, in Syria, in Egypt, in, um, um, in some, of, some of your other countries, where these, where these uh, uh, Iran, where we see these rebel forces rising up, seeking to topple the governments. And this is what these barbaric tribes were in their day. They were rebels and they toppled the Roman government or the Western part of the empire. And as they toppled this throughout that time period between the toppling of that government, you see the Christians experiencing and experiencing horrible persecutions from pagan Rome. Those persecutions came to somewhat, they began to lessen almost to the point of extinction during the time of Emperor Constantine. The pagan Emperor Constantine had his nominal conversion. Persecution of the Christians halted for a time. But then we find that pagan Rome would later become papal Rome. <coughs> Excuse me. Or what we know today as the papacy. When pagan Rome transferred to papal Rome, there began a persecution untold like any other. And the Bible lets us know that that persecution or that deadly wound that was given to that papal power is going to return. Future study. But so we find, so this persecution of the Jews, it would go and it would last for a, a, an immense time. It would, it would go on from the time of the apostles. They were persecuted by the pagan powers under the instigation of the Jewish leaders. But then we find the empress continuing under uh, Nero and Justinian and uh, all of these various Diocletian. They brought these persecution upon uh, or, or, or brought these persecutions against the people of God. And it transferred over into or uh, to papal Rome. Again, that's a future study, but just kind of giving you a brief outline of this persecution. And so during this persecution, God would send some more signs. I want you to notice now, notice what our Bible says. We're going to follow the lesson as it is written here, but I want to pull out something quickly um, in a few moments. Let's look at our next question. Question six. Once specific signs did Jesus say would be given immediately after the tribulation of those days. So you're still in Matthew 24. Let's look at verse 29. The Bible says immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So now notice what it says. It says the sun would, the sun would be darkened. The moon shall not give her light. <clears throat> and the stars, the Bible says, would fall from heaven. Now, before we go on, go to the book of Mark, chapter 13. Let's go to Mark, the 13th chapter. I want you to notice what Mark says, because I, I like the way that Mark puts this for us. He's going to 
put it in a particular time frame for us. Immediately after tribulation, um, <clears throat> Matthew says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. Now I want you to notice what Mark says. Mark the 13th chapter, and I want us to look at verse 24. Mark 13, notice what he says in verse 24. Watch this. He says, but in those days after the tribulation shall the sun be darkened. Now, why does he specifically say in those days? Because even while God's people are being persecuted, the time period, their tribulation is going to come to an end. Okay. I'm just giving you a brief overview because we'll study this more when we look in the book of Revelation. The persecution that God's people were suffering under papal Rome would come to a, it would, it would, it would come almost to a grinding halt as a result of the Protestant Reformation. And during the time period as the Protestant Reformation began to gain recognition, world recognition in the old world, God would send signs in the sun in the moon and in the stars. And so as they saw these signs taking place, it would let them know that God's plans for his soon coming are imminent. God would allow his people to see that all these events transpiring are according to the word of God. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 46 and verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning, things that are not yet done, saying that my counsel shall stand and I shall do all my pleasure. God tells us also in the book of Isaiah that his word would not return unto him boy, but it will accomplish the thing whereunto it is sent. And so these signs <clears throat> are given to us as an assurance, <coughs> excuse me, as an assurance that God's word can be trusted. Let's go back to our handout. Notice what it says. It says that the sun would be darkened, the moon would not give her light, and the stars would fall from heaven. Now, on your paper, you have a note there, and that note is for your study. So in lieu of time, I want us to not, I don't want us to break the train of thought as we're going through these events. But I want you to be able to fill those things out. Right here is going to give you the time when these events would take place. But know this, after the tribulation in the day, in a specific time period, would the sun be darkened, the moon would not give its light, and the stars would fall from heaven. But remember we said, we said John also in the revelation takes up this same account. He doesn't mention it in the Gospels, but he mentions it in the Revelation. I want you to notice something. Go to question number seven. Go to question seven. Notice what it says. According to Revelation, which was written by John, what natural disaster would occur just before the signs in the sun, in the moon, and the stars? You're going to Revelation chapter six. <clears throat> The last book of the New Testament, Revelation chapter 6. You're going to the last book. Chapter 6, last book of the Bible, last book of the New Testament, last book of the Bible. Revelation, the sixth chapter, and we're going to be looking at verse 12. What would happen? What natural disaster or what would happen just before the sun would not, the sun would be darkened, and the moon would not give her light and the stars would fall. What event would transpire just before that? Remember in these days, this in a specific time period, all these events were to take place. Watch this. Revelation chapter six, verse 12, the Bible says, and I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, 
there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. In other words, the sun would not give her light and the moon became as blood. So the sun would be darkened and the moon would not give her light. And then it says, verse 13, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a tree, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. So the Bible tells us <clears throat> that there would be a great earthquake. In other words, the sixth seal would be open. Brothers and sisters, let me let you know that we're living under the sixth seal. We're living under the sixth seal. The seventh seal is the coming of Jesus. But we're living under the sixth seal and there are events that are to transpire. And we're looking at these events, brothers and sisters. You and I, God wants us to know, we will never know the day or the hour in a sense. We are not to make predictions of the day or the hour, but God wants us to know that the day is near. And as the day is near, what manner of person ought we to be or, ma or of our manner of conversation and godliness? We should be living a particular way. Anticipation of Christ's coming. His coming is likened unto a bride. It is likened unto a wedding. And brothers and sisters, there is a little anxiety, I'm sure, a little nervousness as to the wedding, but there is a desire to be wedded nonetheless. So we see these events transpiring, and while there may be a little anxiety, there may be a little weariness, but nonetheless, we look for the Lord's coming still. When John saw these events taking place, John said, even so, Lord, come. Amen. Yeah, I see what we must go through. Yes, I see the events that lead to your coming. But even so, Lord, come. He had a desire to see his beloved Lord. And brothers and sisters, the more you and I draw nigh to Jesus, the more you and I study the Word of God, like Paul, we would be able to embrace these infirmities. We will be able to embrace these calamities. Nothing shall be able to move us, he says in Romans 8, from the love of God. Neither death nor life, neither principalities, nor powers, nor angels, nor things that have come, nor things in the past, nor things that will come, nor things that we're living under now. These cannot separated from the love of God. We must be persuaded of a better world. And so again, we are living under the sixth seal. So the earthquake would happen, then there would be the sun, then the moon, and then the stars. Notice, next question. Question eight. How did Jesus describe the anxiety and trouble that would exist on the earth after these signs. The Bible tells us in the book of Luke chapter 8, Luke the, pardon me, Luke 21, Luke the 21st chapter. Notice what the Word of God tells us in the book of Luke chapter 21, and we're looking at verse 25. Luke the 21st chapter, and we're looking at verse 25. Luke 21, beginning in verse 25. Let's see what would be the state and the, and the anxiety um, and troubles that would exist upon the earth. And so we see this anxiety still exists. We see these troubles have never abated. They're still here. One calamity following another. These events, like birth pains, lets us know that we're coming to the time of deliverance. And anyone who has ever had a child or have known someone that has a child, as she starts to first experience what they call those Braxton Hicks contractions, somewhere, somewhere in the early or mid, uh, mid cycle of having that child, she begins to feel, as it were, the, the, the body beginning to adjust itself for the birth. But as she comes down to that final trimester and as she comes down to those final weeks and even as she comes down to those final hours those contractions began to get stronger and more frequent and at times they may let up and she may have a space where there seems to be a relief 
But then that pulsating begins and they become more repetitive and more and stronger and stronger and longer. And that lets her know that she is dilating and it is time to start pushing. And brothers and sisters, I want to let you to know that the earth is crying out. These events are becoming more and more frequent. The, 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 the earth is preparing itself for these events. And brothers and sisters, more than the earth itself, you and I should be preparing, getting our houses in order, brothers and sisters. Notice what it says. You in Luke 21, verse 25, the Bible says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon <clears throat> and in the stars. And upon the earth, what? Distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. So here the Bible tells us not only will there be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, but he says upon the earth there shall be great distress of nations. And like no other time before, we see a great distress <clears throat> of nations. Now, again, as we continue to go through these events, one thing that we're going to see as we come and as we begin to look at what is actually happening with man, that's what we're going to study next. We're going to look at part two and we're going to see what is actually happening with man. Now, again, as we started in the beginning, there's always been talk of the last days. We have seen things and this is the last days and we've been hearing the cry. Uh, we've heard Harold Camping for a number of years uh, sound a trumpet that the Lord is coming, and yet we see no signs of it. We know that God has not given us a day or the hour. But brothers and sisters, one thing that as I said before, and we cannot overemphasize, there are events <clears throat> that God says we must look for. Often in years gone by, all of the events were not there. Yes, we see the increase of crime, Yes, we see a disobedient of parents. It seems like there's always been a disobedient of parents. Ever since the days of Cain, there have been disobedient of parents. There has been earthquakes. There has been different things that people have seen or thought they have seen. But brothers and sisters, when you start putting all the events together, when you start linking them all together, and you begin to start seeing what's happening among the nations and the things that are transpiring in the earth, then this lets us know that we're nearing to the time. And we're going to study these things out in detail. Now we're just looking at <clears throat> events that shows us that we're near to this event. Brothers and sisters, we're under the sixth seal. There's only seven seals. That alone should let us know that we're living in the end. But notice this. As we close, I want to close on this thought. We quoted it, but I want us to read it. Go to first, second Peter chapter three, go to second Peter chapter three. We quoted it, but I want us to end on this note because often as we, as we said, we, when we think about the end, there is an anxiety of fear that arises upon us as though God desires destruction, as though God is looking to bring pain. Brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It tells us that we should love him because he first loved us. God has no desire to bring destruction to anyone, brothers and sisters, but God realizes that there are those who have postured themselves against him. And regardless of what God can and, and has done for them, they refuse to admonish the power of God. They refuse to give in to the tender pleadings of the Spirit's voice to their hearts. And the Bible tells us here in the book of, in first, second Peter chapter three, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that what? Any, how many, any should perish, but that all, how many all should come to repentance? Peter starts this off with scoffers are going to arise and begin to, begin to cast 
reproach upon the coming of Christ. Not just from the openly irreligious, but from the church, from the ministers in the pulpit will begin to cast, will begin to, 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 to cast reproach upon the prophecies of God, upon the coming of Christ. But Peter says, know this, that God is not slack. Yes, it may seem as all things are continuing as they are, but we can look around the world and know that the world is not the same as it was when we were a child, but just know that God is long-suffering. God is not desiring that any would be lost, but God is desiring for repentance. God desires to save. Jesus prayed, Lord, I will that they, not just the disciples, but they that believe on him through their word would be with me where I'm Am. That is God's prayer. That is Jesus' greatest joy. That will and should be the joy of his people today. And brothers and sisters, we must be determined to make that the joy of everyone by telling them that Jesus loves them and he died for them and he desires for them to be ready. Could we be our final generation? Brothers and sisters, we have entered into those final days of this earth's history. We have entered into the final times. Again, we know not the day or the hour, but the events lets us know that we are near. The events lets us know that we are near. Brothers and sisters, I pray that you stay tuned for our next lesson as we go into part two of lesson three, Could We Be Earth's Final Generation? Until then, may God bless, and we look forward to seeing you again.